Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Kari and today I'm going to be doing a little recent reads wrap up. So I'm going to be talking about everything that I've read so far in 2023. So I've already read some really good stuff, stuff that I've given five stars and also some not so good stuff. I've even given like two stars already this year. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to present the books to you in the order that I read them. So in 2022, as you may know, if you've been around my channel before, I started reading the A Song of Ice and Fire series, aka the Game of Thrones book series. And I've become obsessed with this series like absolutely obsessed and since I've been so obsessed with the book series I've also gone back to rewatch the TV show which has also reignited my love for the TV show and I found out towards the end of last year that there's actually a biography about the making of the TV show so that's the very first thing that I read this year and that's Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon by James Hibbard so this is just a really interesting like biography of the TV show it has interviews that haven't been seen anywhere else that they're only in this book so you get a really cool insight into the show James Hibbard interviews like HBO exactly executives, the showrunners, a bunch of the actors from the show. And through all these interviews, you learn a lot of anecdotes about things that happened on the show and like insights into what the actors were experiencing through a lot of these shoots. So for example, if you remember the long night battle scene in season eight, that was super controversial, but apparently that shoot was just absolutely horrible for all of the actors. Like it took months to film and it was just absolutely dreadful for the actors. They had like the worst time. So it's really interesting to learn things like that. And it's not just season eight that they talk about. They talk about things from the beginning of the show. So from season one to the end of the show, they talk about everything. Another example of what they talk about how it affected the actors is the actor who played Theon Greyjoy. So obviously if you know the series, you know that Theon gets absolutely destroyed like mentally and physically. And that was really hard on the actor. Like he kind of brought it home with him and it really affected his mental health. Obviously that's horrible, but it's really interesting insight into the show. Also they talk about a lot of things that happen in like certain scenes that maybe you didn't notice when you're watching it. So for example, at the Red Wedding, you know, the infamous Red Wedding. You know, there's a band that starts playing the Reigns of Castamere and apparently one of the musicians in the band is the drums player from Coldplay. I freaking love Coldplay. So that is just so cool. Like a little anecdote that just makes this really, really fun. It's funny because we learned that little tidbit in an interview with the actor who plays Roose Bolton. So obviously he plays a huge role at the Red Wedding. And so he's talking about that they weren't filming, like they were just sitting around waiting for the next scene. And he was just talking to this guy who was playing in the band. He didn't know who he was. And he finds out that this musician is English. And so he tells us that he's thinking to himself, you know, why did they bring an English musician in? Aren't there enough Irish musicians that they could have used, you know, because they film in Ireland. And so he's just really intrigued by this guy. He's talking to him more and more. And he asks this guy, like, do you play music full time? Or is this just something that you do for fun? And the guy's like, oh yeah, you know, I'm in a band. We're pretty successful. So I am lucky enough that I get to do this full time. And the actor for Ruth Bolton is like, oh yeah, well, what's the group? You know, just kind of being polite. And the guy goes, oh, we're, we're called Coldplay. <laughs> Like what are the biggest groups of all time? And this actor for Ruth Bolton is just like, oh yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> So anyway, all that to say, there's just a lot of fun anecdotes throughout this whole book, a lot of really cool interviews, a lot of things that you don't notice when you're watching it. At least I didn't notice a lot of these things that they talk about. So this was just really, really fun. I would definitely recommend this book if you love the TV show because it was just really, really fun. So this was the very first thing that I read this year and I gave this five stars. So in my video where I talked about my favorite books of 2022, I said that my second favorite book of the year was Bunny by Mona Awad. And I talked about how weird this book is, but how much I loved that weirdness that I, I just ate it up. And in the comments, of that video, one of you guys, Lily, recommended another book that they thought would be perfect for me since I loved Bunny. I was really excited to go pick up this book that they recommended because like I said, since I loved Bunny, I'm looking for anything that's gonna give me those vibes. And so on Lily's recommendation, I read In the Miso Soup by Ryo Murakami. So the comparison to Bunny is definitely accurate. Now the stories are completely different, like it's not similar in the stories, but just the weird dark vibes that it gives, on point. So this is actually a pretty short story, but there's a lot packed into this. So this is actually a translation from Japanese and it follows Kenji, who's a nightlife guide in Tokyo. So basically tourists hire him to take them around the nightlife scene of Tokyo. And not just like the regular nightlife, it's like the scandalous side of the nightlife in Tokyo. His service is a little bit under the table because of the places that he takes these tourists. So this story follows Kenji who gets hired by an American named Frank. So Frank is traveling alone to Tokyo and he hires Kenji to take him around the darker side of Tokyo nightlife. 
But we start to see that Frank maybe isn't only interested in the services that Kenji usually provides. And Kenji starts to feel a little bit more and more uncomfortable around Frank. So like I said, this does get very dark. And I did feel pretty like stressed out and like worried about what was going to happen. Like I said, this is translated from the Japanese and I have to say the translation is excellent. It really seems like English is the original language in this, so bravo to the translator. And the translator is Ralph McCarthy, so excellent job, Ralph. I really, really enjoyed this. I gave this four stars. If you're watching, Lily, thank you so much for the recommendation. I loved it. Without even realizing it, after reading In the Miso Soup, I jumped directly to another in translation from Japanese book and another one that people call very weird. And that's Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. So this follows Natsuki in different parts of her life from childhood into being an adult. And she's always felt like she doesn't fit into society, that she feels like she's an alien even, that she doesn't belong on the earth. And that one day aliens are gonna come save her and her boyfriend. And they're like really committed to this idea. Like they actually think this is going to happen. So that adds a really weird element to the story. Like, okay, is that really going to happen? You know, we have to wait around and see, is that actually gonna happen? Is that that something that exists in this world so I really really like that aspect of not knowing is that actually gonna happen or is she just delusional I was really looking forward to reading this because Jack Edwards said that this is one of the weirdest things he's ever read and like when people say something's weird I'm like sign me up I want to read anything that people say is weird but honestly I kept waiting for this to get like even more weird especially coming off in the miso soup which was really unsettling I was looking for this to get even more weird just because people always say it's weird you know what I mean and maybe it would have been better if I had never heard anything about this book and I didn't have such high expectations. I mean, it definitely is weird, but not as weird as I was expecting. Does that make sense? Also, as opposed to In the Miso Soup where the translation was excellent, this translation just didn't work for me. The sentences were just so simple and that made it kind of boring to read. And the sentences even felt unnatural at times, like we would never talk like that. So that really prevented me from loving this. Also, there's a lot of themes about fitting into society in this, which generally I really like that theme, but this was just so obvious that the author was trying to make a commentary about not fitting in and not meeting society's expectations. Like it was just too obvious, you know what I mean? Like I like it better when clearly the author trusts the reader to catch on to the themes without really shoving it in your face and making it so obvious like hey this is the theme this is the lesson you're supposed to learn I didn't have any problems with the story itself I just feel like if the writing or maybe just the translation was better and that if it was more nuanced and less obvious I think I would have really loved this in the end I ended up giving this three stars I won't go into too much detail about the next book because I know that this is a really niche topic but I've recently gotten into yoga and meditation and so I wanted to read a book about meditation and what are the benefits of meditation and so I did a lot of research into what are the best books about meditation and a lot of people recommended the miracle of mindfulness I was looking for more of like a scientific approach like what are the benefits of meditating and this really wasn't that I am still glad that I read this but overall I just didn't really click with this one and I gave it three stars if you know of any good books about meditation that you would recommend definitely put them in the comments I would love to check them out all right next is a book that I loved i loved this book so much and honestly i don't even know what to say about it because i just loved it so much and this is just such a my type of book that i want to gush about it but i really don't even know what to say like does that ever happen to you like you love something so much that you don't even know how to talk about it maybe that sounds really weird but anyway let me tell you what the book is it's vladimir by julia may jonas now I've said this before, when I hauled this book and I did like a book shopping vlog where I bought this book, I hate this cover. This is the US cover. I absolutely hate it. It does not fit with the vibe of the book. Like it looks like a romance book. It's not a romance book. I hate this cover, but I was too impatient to wait around for the UK edition to be published. And so I bought this one, even though I 100% could have waited around for the UK edition because I waited forever to actually pick up this book. Anyway, <laughs> all that to say, don't pay attention to this cover. It does not reflect the depth and the nuance and the beauty of the writing of the story. So this follows an unnamed female character who is an English professor at a university. So I believe that she's like in her 50s, like mid 50s, I believe. And she's married to another professor at the same university. However, her husband has recently been accused of having relationships with some of his students. So that plotline is kind of always running in the background as we follow the main protagonist and what's happening in her life. 
that she's trying to cope with what all her colleagues think about her and her husband and what even some of her students are saying to her because like I said she is a professor at the same university so a lot of her female students are upset with her because she's choosing to stay with her husband and so the choices that her husband has made are affecting her job so we have that whole plot line kind of running in the background but really the main part of this story is that there's another professor at the university and he's new and that would be the titular Vladimir so Vladimir is a lot younger than her I think he's about maybe 10 years younger than her 12 years younger than her and the main character just gets absolutely wrapped up in him and is constantly thinking about him the problem is is that Vladimir is married and has a daughter and he's seemingly really happy in his marriage so the best that the main character can do is kind of flirt with him and kind of be content with that you know all she can do is flirt with him and she's gonna get the most out of that that she can and so this is really about the psychology of this woman that she has this story with what's going on with her own husband and grappling with what she's agreed to with her husband the situation that she's gotten herself into with her husband and then these feelings that she's starting to have for this other man that she can't have and I have to tell you how beautiful this writing is it's insane the writing is so smart, so witty, so beautiful. It really makes me think of Sorrow and Bliss by Meg Mason. If you loved Sorrow and Bliss, you have to read this book. Like the writing is as amazing as Sorrow and Bliss. It's just that sharp wit, that sharp humor, the beauty of the writing, like even the most mundane things that are being explained, like it sounds so beautiful. And if you enjoy stories that follow the psychology of women, I would definitely recommend this. I love this book so much. I'm so happy that I read it. I wanna read it again, honestly. And I just love anything that follows a professor or a teacher or anything set in an academic setting. So this really touched on some tropes that I really enjoy. And I think I'm gonna buy the UK cover because this cover just does not evoke the beauty of this story, the nuance of this story, the themes of this story. Like. <laughs> I just really don't like this and the UK one is really nice. I like it. Actually, it's quite similar to the US cover of Sorrow and Bliss now that I think about it. That's crazy. Another parallel between Sorrow and Bliss and Vladimir. But yeah, obviously I gave this five stars. I would definitely recommend it. I don't know what else I could say. Like I said, it's hard to talk about things that I love so much, which is kind of paradoxical, I guess. <laughs> I highlighted so many things throughout this story, like the funny lines, the beautiful lines. Like seriously, probably almost every page I was highlighting something. All right, I wanna read you just a couple quotes from this so bear with me if you're not interested you could just skip in the timestamps to the next book he didn't want to leave it felt like young love I thought responsibilities looming the mounting anxiety of your life building while you clung lolling pointlessly in bed to a new someone who gave you a sad and fearful pleasure yes I had academic aptitude I was excited to do well and to be petted like a pretty cat who moves with assurance and I was passionate so passionate about the books I read and the way they made me feel I love that the complexities of my emotions were understood by authors writing hundreds of years ago. I loved looking at their texts and trying to understand what they were aiming to do, to pull my own meaning from them, to point out what others didn't see or notice. He was humoring me, this maternal woman, probably so outdated in her views and opinions, with lines and places I had yet to realize. Next, I read a new release thriller that just came out, and that's The Drift by CJ Tudor. So this is a really fun multi-POV thriller. One point of view follows a girl who was just in a bus accident, that a whole bus of students on their way to something called The Retreat, we don't know what The Retreat is, that they have an accident, and that a bunch of people in the accident die, but then the survivors are trapped the way that the bus crashed, that they can't get out of it. So they have to figure out, how are we gonna get out of this bus? And they start to learn more and more things about the people inside the bus. Another point of view is a girl who's trapped in a cable car. It's a pretty big cable car, so there's a good few people in the cable car with her, but one of the people in the cable car is dead. Now something that both of these points of view have in common is that they just wake up and find themselves in these situations. So obviously the car accident, you know, she probably lost consciousness during the car accident and then wakes up after the accident. Same thing with the cable car. She just wakes up, comes to consciousness, and she's in this cable car with a bunch of people. And then the third and final point of view is from a guy who's living in a shower with a bunch of other people, but we understand that there's some dark secret about this place that they're staying at. So throughout the whole story, we're trying to figure out what is the connection between these three points of view. And in the background of all three stories, we understand that there's been some kind of pandemic in this world. We don't really know what are the effects of the pandemic, what types of pandemic is it, what caused the pandemic. We're just kind of slowly starting to see what are the effects of this pandemic. The setting for all three stories is really snowy, 
isolated. I mean, it's the perfect read for winter. I would definitely recommend reading this before winter is done, especially if it's snowy where you are. This would be an excellent snowy vacation read. There's kind of a surprising element to this. I'm not gonna say what it is, but there's a surprising like genre element to this. And I'm surprised that I didn't mind it because if somebody would have told me that element was in this before I started reading it, I probably would have been a little skeptical, but in the end, I didn't mind it. And this was really, really fun to read. It's actually quite long for a thriller, but I kept turning the pages and I read this really, really quickly because I just wanted to know what the heck is gonna happen. I didn't see the twist coming, which is always a huge plus for me when I read thrillers. I don't wanna be able to guess the ending. And overall, I would just really recommend this. I mean, this probably isn't the best thriller that I've ever read, but I really, really enjoyed it. I had a really fun time reading it. And for that reason, I did give it five stars. Next is another nonfiction book that I read. And I've read a book from this author before and I really, really enjoyed it. It actually changed my life. In 2021, I read Eating Animals by Jonathan Saffron Foer. And that's what really pushed me into becoming vegetarian. And then right after finishing that book, I bought his second nonfiction book on a similar topic called We Are the Weather by Jonathan Saffron Foer. So while Eating Animals focuses on why you shouldn't eat meat because if you care about animals, if you love animals, you shouldn't be eating them and really focuses on like factory farming and the treatment of animals in factory farms. This really focuses on how going vegetarian and vegan can affect the climate. So personally, I went vegetarian because I'm a huge animal lover. I want to protect animals. The treatment of animals in factory farming is insane, awful, horrendous, absolutely disgusting. And so that was my motivation for going vegetarian and I'm trying to go vegan, but it's a bit harder, but I am definitely vegetarian. But I was interested in reading the arguments for going vegetarian slash vegan for the environment. Initially, I wasn't super interested in reading this book, but then Lena Norms, who's a YouTuber, she did a book club video with Ariel Bissette where they read this book and that really convinced me that I would be interested in reading this book because they both really enjoyed it. So while I did enjoy this book, it's nothing compared to eating animals in my opinion. Eating animals is is one of the most powerful things I've ever read and it was literally life-changing. I did enjoy this, I did learn some things, but it's just not as powerful as eating animals in my opinion. This book is really just a call to action to appreciate our life on earth and the resources that we have and encouraging people to appreciate that so much that they take action to protect it. And his argument is, is that everyone should be at least 66% vegetarian and lean towards vegan. And so that's why the little subtitle is Saving the Planet Begins at Breakfast because he's saying that for breakfast and lunch, everyone should be vegetarian hopefully vegan, and then only eat meat for dinner, and that that would make enough difference to start protecting the environment. Something that I did really enjoy about this book is that he talks about after he wrote Eating Animals and he went on like a book tour. So obviously that book is about being vegetarian, right? But in this book, he talks about how when he was on that tour, you know, he was just exhausted, traveling around the country, doing all these talks, going back to a hotel, and that he would go back to his hotel and eat a cheeseburger when he's doing this book tour about being vegetarian. And I just really appreciated that honesty because he was saying, you know, eating meat, was just such a comfort thing for him growing up and it was something easy to do. And so I just found that really interesting, the honesty that he had about his own experience being vegetarian. So while I did enjoy this, I would still definitely recommend eating animals over this if you're interested in learning more about vegetarianism, veganism, factory farming, animals. Would definitely recommend that over this. I ended up giving this three stars. All right, the most recent book that I finished is actually another new release. There's been so many good books coming out the beginning of this year. And so I was really happy to jump on this one right away and that's Mother by Zoji Stage. This is the author of Baby Teeth, which I've never read, but I've heard a lot of good things about. First of all, I absolutely love this cover. It's really simple, but I just freaking love this cover so much. So this is a thriller and it follows a woman named Grace who's a hairstylist and she lives on her own. She just recently bought her own house and she has a really we'll call it unique hobby. Basically, she's catfishing people, specifically young women, but she's justifying it to herself that she's trying to improve these women's lives. She's trying to be like the emotional rock for these women and really motivate them to make the changes that they need in their life. So that's kind of how she's justifying it to herself that it's not wrong. It's not really bad catfishing because I'm helping them. So you can see the kind of psychological state that this main character is in. But from the beginning of this story, we're also in the middle of the pandemic. So obviously she can't be working as a hairstylist because all all of those things have closed down for the pandemic. And since she just bought this house, she's really concerned financially, like how am I gonna pay for this house if I'm not working? So her mom offers to move in with her and then her mom can help financially pay for the house. Well, Grace is really unsure about this because she doesn't have the best relationship with her mom, but she's really kind of in a bind because she does need help financially to be paying for this house since she's not working. So she agrees to let her mom move in with her. So her mom moves in and not only is this really upsetting for her because she's losing her independence, you know, she has this rough relationship with her mom, 
mom already, but also her mom brings up a lot of history from Grace's childhood with her. And this is something that Grace doesn't really like to think about, but having her mom there, it makes her think about all these things from her childhood. So that's really it for the plot summary. I mean, you have the idea of what this story is about, but a huge element of this story is Grace having nightmares. Grace has nightmares, all the time. And the author really kind of tricks you into thinking that her nightmares are real. And then when the next chapter starts, you realize, oh, that was just a nightmare. But it happens all the time. And even one time she's having a nightmare and then it goes to the next chapter and you think you're back to real life because that's usually the structure of it. But in reality, she's just having another nightmare. And then you have to wait till the next chapter to get back to her real life. Like, I hate when people tell me about their dreams like if it's just really quick whatever but when people go into huge detail about what their dreams were like I don't care <laughs> and like so reading about these dreams these nightmares I did not care like I want reality I don't care what her nightmares were I feel like that's just a really cheap way of storytelling any author can make these crazy ass dreams these crazy nightmares and be like "Ooh, look how spooky these nightmares are like no that's not part of the story like that's so cheap to me you know what I mean and the other thing is is that she's constantly having these nightmares like it's seriously all the time she's having a nightmare and so it's very repetitive super super repetitive and I did not enjoy that also I mean I don't really mind reading about this the pandemic but since I had just read the drift and that deals with the pandemic you know I really feel like I had that on the mind and I've been watching the last of us which deals with the pandemic so at this point I was just really like done with pandemic stuff so that really didn't help either even though I am normally a no plot just vibes kind of girl this was really just nothing happens and the, but when something does happen it's the same thing over and over again like her nightmares it's just over and over again i don't know i just didn't like it and then, like i said i didn't care about the main character i was really disappointed with the catfishing element i felt like that could have been super well used and made to be really interesting because that's something i've never read about before someone who's catfishing people but it really wasn't made to be interesting at all i was hoping that the ending would save it but in the end it didn't because this book has a prologue and it spoils the ending of the book the prologue is the ending of the book. So through the whole story, you know what's gonna happen. I absolutely hate that. I hate when prologues are the end of the story and so there's no surprise to the end of the story. Like, why do authors do that? I don't understand. The prologue is the end of the book. So the whole time I'm reading the book thinking like, oh, something else is gonna happen from the prologue, you know, it's gotta be something else, something surprising has to happen. No, it's the prologue. I don't understand. <laughs> So anyway, I really didn't like this one. I'm really tempted to give it one star, but I don't know if that's too harsh. I mean, because I did really like the catfishing element. I don't know. Maybe I should give it a 1.5. Anyway, all that to say, I, I didn't enjoy it. I'm really sad too, because I thought I was really gonna like it. And especially this cover, this awesome cover is wasted on this book, which is really sad. I hate to see that happen, but yeah, really, really sad. So those were the eight books that I've read so far in 2023. Some really excellent books, some books that are gonna become my favorites of all time, like Vlad that's definitely going on my favorite books of all time list and some not so great books like mothered <laughs> I would love to know what you've been reading lately have you read anything really good or really terrible put it in the comments let me know please like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't already I would love to have you back and I'll talk to you again next time bye